back again. Dr. Dennis Spielfeld, president of the Institute of Lutheran Theology, talking today about Plato's metaphysics. Okay, well, uh, with Plato, fundamental, uh, of course, is the distinction between form and matter. And if we talked about with Heraclitus, matter is in a state of uh, change all of the time. And we cannot have knowledge of matter because there's nothing stable to be known. So we can have knowledge of forms because they're stable. But the forms aren't in the matter because the matter is perpetually changing. At least that's how Plato seems to have argued at this point and how he's been understood. So you see over on your right how there are particulars and these particulars participate in forms. So when I know that the sheep is white, I know that the form of sheep has a certain relation to the form of white. That they're, the sheep has whiteness, right? Sheep are white. Now, uh, <clears throat> this form matter distinction, as I say, traces along with this notion of participation. And this is a, a difficult concept participation. It's not so difficult to write, but it's not easy to think about. Uh, presumably, um, a horse has a form, and various particulars participate in the form to various levels. So we have a form of horse, and of course, the form has all of the virtues possible. So the form of hoarseness would be a horse with the wonderful conformation, its bodily shape, muscled in the right ways and can run very fast, right? Now the particular Bocephalus, which is what I think Alexander the Great wrote, right? Bocephalus, a horse, participated more in the form of hoarseness than old Dobbin, the mare, goes like that in the back, out in the pasture, right? Now this idea of form gives Plato uh, a measuring stick to judge what things are better than other things. Bocephalus is just a better horse than old Dobbin because it participates more fully in the form of hoarseness. And whoever won the, won the Kentucky Derby last year, I should know this, but I don't remember right now, participates probably very highly in the form of hoarseness. Of course, this is the same for human beings, right? Human beings that cultivate their intellectual and moral virtues, and for uh, Plato, no mathematics, are good at dialectic, we haven't talked about these things. Um, these uh, human beings participate more fully in human being than those that don't. And of course, if you're just a slave out there doing menial work and uh, ruled by your belly, you don't participate very highly in being human. So this is a very, if you think about it, very anti-democratic and very elite notion here, uh, metaphysics. Some things are better than others. So we have this form of thing, and we have individual things. Plato talks about mathematical ideas now as purely formal, because particulars uh, don't really participate in them. And we, what we can do here is we can talk about all of this stuff at great length, or we can just try to present enough to get us by uh, for this course. Uh, objects in the material world participate in the forms, so the particulars participate in forms. But we have a problem uh, in trying to understand how the atomic forms connect to the higher forms. For instance, uh, Old Dobbin participates in the form of hoarseness, and Theophany 
participates in the, uh, I had a sheep once by that name, uh, participates in the order uh, or in the form of sheep, right? But both horse and sheep are mammals, but they don't really participate in the same way in mammality as the particulars participate in the atomic forms, horse, mission, and sheep. Yes. So this is the so-called problem of the blended forms. And as you move up the ladder from particulars to atomic forms, intermediate forms, and the ideal forms, um, the metaphor of participation tends to be, uh, there tends to be a change or a substitution uh, of the notion of blendedness. To go into this more deeply uh, would, again, take us beyond what we want to talk about here. Uh, but as you're going to see, uh, Plato's view here is that of an ontological dualism. Um, we have the world of being, forms. We have matter, the world of becoming. And we have this participation uh, in, of matter in the atomic forms, that is, the lowest forms in the world of being. Now, uh, you've read, perhaps, uh, about the cave. Hmm? And it's a great story. It's one of the classics of the Western tradition. There are students now that graduate from colleges that don't know anything about the cave. And that's a pity, uh, because everybody should know uh, about this. It's in the Republic. And of course, this image is that of prisoners who are, as you can see in the picture there, they are chained in their seats and they're looking at a wall. And they're looking at shadows on the wall, but this is the only thing the prisoners have ever seen. So they believe that the uh, shadows on the wall uh, are the real thing. They did not know that behind them there stood a roadway, if you will, and behind that, a fire. And that what they were seeing on the wall was merely the shadows cast by uh, movements of bodies on the roadway. The fire, of course, illuminates the uh, bodies on the roadway, and it casts shadows uh, on the wall. Now, these guys sitting down there uh, watching this, uh, they're not having a great deal of fun, but it, at least they're all seeing the same things. They know what's real. It's the stuff on the wall. One of these prisoners all of a sudden uh, finds his way out of this thing. He gets up and he walks out. He actually gets up, gets rid of his chains, and he starts walking back and he sees real stuff there on the roadway. And then somehow he even sees some diffuse daylight and actually walks out of the cave and is hit by the power of the sun. Wow, amazing, right? The sun, his eyes are blinded because all he's known is darkness, so he has to try to figure this out. And he's so excited about this that he runs back down to tell everyone else. Um, runs back down to tell everyone else about this. And when he gets back down, they listen to him, and they become very angry, right? Because this guy is crazy. He's either crazy or he's trying to deceive them. There ain't nothing out there. We know what reality is. It's the shadows on the wall. Anybody going to tell us anything else? We're going to get really mad. OK, so uh, what we have here is the classical story of the philosopher, right? The philosopher sees things that others don't see. He or she understands realities that they don't know about. I didn't tell the story about Thales, but of course he was looking up in the air, thinking about what others don't fall about. He fell in a well, and then the slave girl came by. Well, the maiden with some water kind of made fun of the guy, right? Keep looking out there. You can't even see where you're going. So this was the original act of women making fun of philosophers, right? Of course, that's all been the tradition as well. At any rate, uh, what we have here in the cave, of course, is the, um, the shadow, 
And the shadow is our material reality, right? And those things on the roadway, those real objects, are like the forms. And the forms cast uh, their shadow into matter. And so what we see when we're doing science, we're looking at material things, are only shadows of reality. Now if we could but climb out of this thing, we could actually go to the highest form, the form of all forms, which is the good. Well here it's the sun, but the sun is, in some sense, analogous to the good. The sun is something that we can't make out. It's, it, it lights everything else up, but we, we can't really describe it, particularly if we've never been out of a cave before. And that's how it is with the good. We want to tell people how excited we are about having this experience of something so transcendent and ineffable. But when we do it, we look like absolute idiots, right? So Plato, the great rationalist, and maybe this is true of all great rationalists, they, they have a moment of the mystical. Because when you push reason far enough, you run up against the limits of reason. Now you could stop there and like the biologist in the community college down the street, just say, well, that's just the way it is. Or you might want to look for the transcendental conditions for the possibility of it being what it is. And what are the transcendent conditions or transcendental conditions for that and that and that. And if you push that far enough, you finally get to the thing that Kant called the unconditional that conditioned by no other thing. And in the face of the unconditional, it's hard to say much. Well, so one of the great stories of humankind there in the cave. Plato also talks about the divided line. He's a great dualist and this is a good thing to think. Divided line, we have a world of appearances we have visible things and we have images of those things. But we have the, the large line there that separates the uh, uh, vertical line. And everything above that line is the realm of the forms or the intelligible world. Everything below that line is the realm of appearances. But within the realm of appearances and within the realm of the intelligible world, we also have this uh, situation of reality and shadow, right? So visible things cast shadows. When I was a kid, I'd look out of my window and I could see, because uh, I lived on a farm, I could see which hogs were doing what because in the, wind, in the morning, the sun would cast shadows and you could actually see out there in the lawn uh, shadows of the hogs in the morning, but it had to be early. Uh, in the intelligible world, we have forms that cast a type of shadow, and this gets us into uh, areas of platonic scholarship that there's controversy, but these are the realms of the mathematical objects. So the forms are higher than the mathematical objects, and there are reasons for that, and then the highest form is the good, the form of form. Okay, so we have a ladder of being coming from images to visible things to mathematical objects to forms to the good. And the good is the form of all forms. It is that which makes all knowledge possible, if you think about it. Now notice Plato didn't call this water. <laughs> Plato is not a naturalist. Plato is a dualist. Plato uh, believes uh, that uh, the mental realm, if you will, uh, which would be that intelligible world, is in some sense higher than the, the material realm. have to be careful with how I'm using the word mental. Now, there are certain states of mind associated with th these worlds. Uh, when I grasp uh, uh, mere images, I'm imagining Icacia. When I'm looking at uh, visible things and saying, whoa, there's a sheep over there, that's a belief. Pistis, this is all in the realm of doxa, 
opinion. Peace is his belief. It's, you know, sometimes we talk about in the New Testament, that's belief in God. Uh, here, uh, we're talking about visible things in Plato. Then our thinking about mathematical objects, these are basically uh, logical relationships. If A, then B. If B, then C. Then if A, then C. That would be an example of a configuration of mathematical objects. So thinking that is dionoia or dianoia. Uh, then we have, when we know the forms themselves, we have episteme, right? And we could have a knowledge, uh, episteme of the forms. We might know them intellectually, a noesis. Uh, so we have noesis or episteme of the forms and uh, the good then is a non particular way of knowing. I mean the good is only grasp and a mystical uh, understanding that is a kind of a noesis. So there is the divided line of Plato and here you go. The fundamental distinction for Plato is between the good right, and the things that are good between the beautiful and the things that are beautiful, between the just and the things that are just. Now you should be hearing echoes of Socrates' intentional definition over and against the extensional, right? And then if you climb up here from images to material objects to the lower forms to the higher forms, you get the form of the good, which is the form of all forms. And that can only be grasped in an intellectual uh, intuition of the highest kind. We're going to be talking about the Timaeus here, and we'll be getting into uh, Plato's cosmology. The Timaeus, we're going to discover, is a likely story he gives. This is a late work of Plato, probably. He argues uh, uh, that uh, there is a divine craftsman, a demiurge it's called. We'll be talking about that. We're going to talk about uh, how uh, the world has a, is a type of reflection of the goodness uh, of the uh, forms that are uh, brought about through the demiurge. The Greek gods here serve as intermediaries. The humans are uh, come across or are correlated with stars, so our material bodies are uh, correlated uh, with stars. And uh, the book you're reading by Diogenes Allen, uh, he believes, of course, that the, 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 the Timaeus functions uh, uh, really to connect cosmology to uh, a moral tale, a moral story. And we'll be talking all about that next time. So be back. We'll be back. Thanks.